Good afternoon and welcome to our Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar, Challenges and Opportunities for Conserving Rare Grassland Plants with Dr. Matthew Albrecht. My name is Haley Howard and I'm the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. I wanna thank you all for joining us for this webinar today. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put those in the Q&A section on your screen and at the end, MPF Executive Director Carol David will read those out to Matthew. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with the resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. And now for some background on our speaker. Dr. Matthew Albrecht is a conservation scientist and director of the Missouri Botanical Gardens Center for Conservation and Sustainable Development. He is also an honorary adjunct professor in the Department of Biology at Washington University. His research focuses on the conservation and ecology of at-risk plant species and restoration of native, native biodiversity in degraded ecosystems. He works closely with partners to apply his research findings to support science-based decision-making. He has authored or co-authored over 50 scientific journal articles and book chapters covering a wide range of topics in plant conservation, management, and restoration. We are excited to have Matthew here today to share his native plant expertise with us. And now I will hand it over to you, Matthew. Okay, thank you very much, Haley, and thank you to the Missouri Prairie Foundation for inviting me to speak uh, this afternoon. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here, uh, to be able to share my work uh, on conserving um, rare grassland plant species. So my goal for the audience today is, is for you to um, come away from this talk with a greater understanding of the diversity and variation of grassland systems across the southeastern United States, including here in southern Missouri, to have a kind of greater um, appreciation of the incredible diversity and array of wildflowers that depend on our grassland systems. And then at the end of my talk, I'm going to sort of talk about um, how we can apply some of our, our sort of conservation tools um, to conserve at-risk grassland plant species. So grasslands are one of the dominant biomes on the planet, and they represent about 40% of the terrestrial area. And they're found on every continent except Antarctica. And I'm sure this audience and the, of the Missouri Prairie Foundation is, is well familiar that the temperate grasslands here in um, Central North America are one of the most endangered biomes on the planet. And what I'm showing you here on the left-hand um, side of the, of the slide is some work that was done by some scientists back in the mid-2000s where they looked across the planet at a number of different biomes, and they looked at how much habitat had been protected within those biomes. So these are places like deserts, tropical rainforest, um, temperate forest. And then they looked at how much habitat had been converted uh, within those biomes. And so if you look at that ratio, um, which is the CRI ratio um, in, in this graphic, turns out temperate grasslands are the most endangered biome on Earth. And on the map on the right-hand part of the slide, you'll see areas that are highlighted red, and those are sort of critically endangered uh, uh, regions uh, of grasslands uh, throughout the world. And many of those places, a lot of those places are in the temperate zone. And if you notice where we're at here in central US, we're right in the middle of a, of a critical sort of crisis ecoregion, and that's our temperate grassland systems. So our grasslands tend to harbor a disproportionate number of at-risk plant species. And this is particularly true in the southeastern United States, where we've been doing a lot of our work at the Missouri Botanical Garden. Um, we were part of a working group a few years ago led by uh, the Southeastern Grasslands Institute and Reed Noss and Dwayne Estes, and um, the group identified about 600 at-risk plant taxa that were concentrated in southeastern grasslands and woodlands. And if we look at the Endangered Species Act, only about 11% of at-risk flora in the U.S. is protected. And so th there's a vast number of species 
that are not afforded protection under the Endangered Species Act, but are still at risk of extinction. And many of these species are, are grassland dependent species. And so conservation actions are urgent to prevent many of these species future extinction. So our primary approach for plant conservation is a coarse filter approach, right? So this is what the Missouri Prairie Foundation has been so successful at identifying uh, uh, higher quality grassland remnants, protecting those remnants, and then managing them to help uh, maintain and perpetuate grassland biodiversity. For some rare species, however, this coarse filter approach just isn't enough. And in some cases, we find that rare species sort of fall through the sieve of our, of our coarse filter ecosystem-based conservation approach. So our, our network of protected areas that we have to try to conserve as much biodiversity as possible and, and represent as much biodiversity as possible of grassland systems sometimes just doesn't capture um, some of these rare elements of our flora. And these are typically species that have really narrow geographic distributions. They may be highly endemic to specific areas. Those are species that sometimes fall through the cracks, and I'll give some example of those in a little bit in my talk. In other cases, we may be able to protect the habitat of these particular rare species, but something's happened over the course of time where these species continue to decline despite our best efforts to manage those species within our protected networks. So, for example, some grassland species are sensitive to um, habitat fragmentation or landscape scale fragmentation that maybe disrupts historical patterns of gene flow, maybe pollinator movement, and this may in turn cause sort of genetic bottlenecks in, 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 in really rare species. In other cases, some of our grassland species are really sensitive to long-term fire exclusion. And they've, um, you know, they've, what's happened is they've sort of have a demographic bottleneck um, over, over time. And just simply reintroducing fire to our grassland systems sometimes isn't enough to reverse the decline of these species. So these kinds of species need a different approach. And that's what we call a fine filter conservation approach or sort of a species by species conservation approach where we sort of identify or diagnose a problem in a species. And then we try to sort of fix, uh, 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 fix that problem or determine management solutions to those problems so we can reverse the decline of those species. So at the Missouri Botanical Garden, we've been taking sort of a four-pronged approach uh, to try to conserve grassland species. And so one of the tools we use here is we use ex situ conservation. This is conserving species kind of outside of their natural habitats. And we do this primarily through um, seed banking. And so we've been doing this for almost 40 years at the Botanical Garden, where we've been going across the region, collecting seeds of our globally rare species, our most at-risk species, and these and conserving them in our frozen seed bank here where the seeds can typically remain viable for many decades. And our seed bank really serves as a safety net or a safeguard in case populations of these species go extinct in the wild. And our seed collections can really capture a pretty good proportion of the genetic variability that is remaining for these species. We're also using tools of population genetics to understand the genetic structure and variation of rare species. To, to again understand where genetic diversity is concentrated in these species, what were the historical patterns of gene flow, and how might we design future conservation and management solutions around these patterns of genetic variability. Third, we've been working on reintroducing populations of at-risk grassland species back into their protected uh, native habitats. And we've been typically using seeds that we've been building up in our seed bank over the course of several decades. And I'll talk about one of the projects we've been working on later. And finally, we've been uh, really more recently sort of conducting science related to how do we restore degraded grassland habitats? And what's the best way to reintroduce uh, grassland dependent species? What kinds of um, treatments can we use to sort of maximize biodiversity and degraded grasslands? And um, that's been sort of some ongoing work that we've been doing, particularly at our Shaw Nature Reserve, uh, where they've been undertaking some large scale grassland restoration projects. So this map just kind of illustrates the geographic sort of 
breadth and diversity of our work here at the Missouri Botanical Garden. This certainly is in all the different species and systems we've been working in, but I just wanted you to get a flavor for um, the places that we've been working at over the past few years and the kinds of incredible wildflowers that we've been fortunate to work with. And most of the species you see here are uh, threatened or endangered or at risk of extinction in the wild. And we've been working on a number of different types of research projects to again, try to reverse their decline. I'm gonna talk about a handful of these in my talk today, but I'm not gonna be able to get to all of them, but I wanted you to just see the sort of scope and scale of, of the work that we're doing here at the garden. So I've been talking about grassland systems, and I think it's best to define what I mean by a grassland system. So when I use the word grassland, I'm referring to a system in which there's a continuous herbaceous cover of graminoids and dicots with or without trees. And this continuous herbaceous cover is the dominant layer in terms of cover or biomass. So typically when we think about our tall grass prairie biome and the Great Plains, we're thinking about largely treeless grasslands. As we move further south and into the east in the southeastern United States, our grassland systems often have a much greater component of woody vegetation with them. And many of our grasslands are sort of embedded in sort of woodland mosaic landscapes. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a second. So grasslands um, can occur in a range of environmental contexts. And I hope um, through some of the illustrations I'm gonna show in, the, in my subsequent slides, you'll see the great diversity of grasslands in, in the southeastern United States that we've been working in. These grasslands really began to appear here about, about 35 million years ago. At least that's when the first open habitat grasses were detected. Here in North America, we think uh, grasslands really didn't start to appear until about 25 million years ago. And when we look at grasslands, ecologists typically divide them up into either arid or semi-arid grassy biomes, and that's what's illustrated in the mustard yellow uh, color in the top part of that graph. And then we have sort of mesic and wet grassy systems, and those are the systems that we've been working in uh, uh, here in the southeastern U.S. So there are four primary drivers of the origin of grasslands and the maintenance of grasslands. So there's edathic and soil conditions, and there's climate, and both of these can place environmental constraints on, on grassland structure and function. And then below, we know that fire is an essential process in maintaining grasslands, but also megafauna historically have played a key role in helping to um, um, explain the origin and development of grasslands. And I put a couple of arrows along these dimensions because many grasslands are shaped by a combination of these different forces. And I'm gonna sort of show you in my subsequent slide some examples of grasslands um, that first are shaped a little bit more by the soil conditions or the edaphic conditions and climatic conditions um, uh, are tend to be a little bit more important in, sh in shaping grassland biodiversity. One of the systems we've been working in are the Nashville Basin, Calcareous Glades, and Barrens uh, a grassland system, and this is in Central Tennessee. And um, glades are essentially rocky grasslands, and we have glades too here in Missouri. We have dolomite glades, we have limestone glades, we have sandstone glades. Uh, these are basically just rocky, shallow soil grasslands that have a sort of edaphic constraint to them. And these shallow soils can create sort of microclimatic extremes. So for example, in these Nashville Basin glades, um, you can have obligate wetland species growing in seeps in the middles of these glades. And then a few meters away, you can have succulent species uh, uh, growing uh, because of, of pretty dramatic changes in the hydrology and just in a few meters. And so these sort of changes create a great deal of diversity and endemism within these systems. To give you a sense of the sort of microclimatic extremes of some of these sort of edaphically constrained grasslands, um, one of our members of our research team, Dr. Adam Smith, set up a series of climate stations across grasslands in the southeastern US. And that's what you're seeing in that upper right-hand picture. So uh, these microclimate stations were measuring air temperature um, and uh, soil temperature about one centimeter below, below the soil surface. And some of our most southern grasslands in Alabama that we put these microclimate stations, we recorded temperatures at 
just below the soil surface around 140 degrees Fahrenheit in the middle of July. That's hot enough to probably fry an egg. And so these are extreme environments in, in terms of the types of environmental stress that plants might experience. And so as a consequence of this, you get, you get lots of plant species that have adapt adaptations to, to, to these extreme drought conditions that happen in summer, or you get species that have life cycle adaptations to avoid these hot summer conditions, and they complete most of their life cycle in the cooler season. These sort of unusual soils that we find across the southeastern US that have helped shape many of our grassland systems, they favor the evolution of extreme endemism. And one example is a species that, that we've worked with in the past. This is Lyrate's bladder pod, Paysonia lyrata. This is a, a little wildflower in the mustard family. It's, a, it's an annual. And it's known from uh, one section of northwestern Alabama. It's known from about three sites in the whole world. So this is a, a extremely rare species, and it's only known from limestone, um, limestone grasslands in this system, extremely shallow soil limestone grasslands. And this is an example of a species that sort of fell through the cracks of our coarse filter conservation system. So only one of the three known populations is protected um, uh, on, in, in, a, in a natural area that's, that's managed by the Nature Conservancy. The other two natural populations occur in unprotected, private, unprotected property. One is a private property that I've shown here with a star that I'm circling. Uh, this is a site that when we went to collect seed from this, from this population, it had a for sale sign and was likely going to be developed into a subdivision because uh, this area is experiencing a lot of exurban development. The other population that's unprotected is on a roadside um, in, in a rural county, and the only thing protecting it is the sign next to the population warning the roadside vegetation crews to not spray herbicide during roadside maintenance because there's an endangered species here. So when you have species that are this rare in, in the landscape, this is where our ex situ conservation and our seed banks really play a critical conservation role because we were able to back up these two populations and in the absence of safeguarding um, seeds from these populations in our seed bank, these populations are highly vulnerable to going extinct. And so our, our seed bank is serving as a backup, as a safeguard in case of, of loss of these populations. So another example, a little closer to home where um, we have unusual soils and edaphic conditions sort of favoring the evolution of grassland endemics or in our limestone glade systems in southwestern Missouri. So this is Missouri bladder pod, Fisaria filiformis. Uh, this is a species also known from northwestern Arkansas and north central Arkansas. So these counties that are highlighted in yellow are counties with known locations of Missouri bladder pod. And then um, down here in the Wachita Mountains, there are a few populations on some unique outcroppings called shale barrens. And these are sort of unique grassland systems that are, occur on, on these shale outcroppings. And um, our research team got interested in understanding the population genetic structure and variation of this species across this entire geographic range. And we wanted to know how genetically diverse populations were and how genetically different these populations might be because the populations in Southwestern Missouri grow on limestone, the populations in northwestern Arkansas grow on dolomite, and the populations in the Wachita's grow on shale. And we suspect that there may be some genetic differentiation on these different geological conditions. So we went out, we collected leaf material from as many populations as possible across this entire geographic range of the species. And this was a project led by our population geneticist, Christy Edwards. And what she found is that um, there's a fair amount of genetic diversity within this within this species, and again, this is a mustard species. It's it's a it's a it's a winter annual, and what I'm showing you up here, each one of these um, each one of these identifiers is a unique population. And so, what you found was that the southwestern Missouri populations tended to group together, the north central Arkansas populations grouped together, and then the northwestern Arkansas population uh, grouped out over here. But what's really interesting is that the populations 
that were further south in the Wachita Mountains on these shale barren systems, they grouped out way down here. They were completely genetically differentiated from the rest of our Missouri bladder pod populations. And in fact, this is what we call our genetic outgroup in this analysis. This is Fisaria gracilis. This is a, a related species that occurs in, in the deeper south in Texas and Louisiana and Oklahoma and southern Arkansas. And the populations of Missouri bladder pod in the Wachitas um, appeared to be even more differentiated from Missouri bladder pod in, in northern Arkansas and Missouri as Fisaria gracilis is. So what does this mean? Well, it means that this is probably a new species to science down here in the Wachita Mountains, and it's what we would call a cryptic species. So if you go look at these populations of bladder pod in the, in the Wachita Mountains of Arkansas, they morphologically look very similar to the populations in Missouri and northern Arkansas. And our current botanical geese really can't differentiate uh, those populations from the ones up north. But genetically, they're highly differentiated. And so we call this a cryptic species. And so we're still discovering new species in our grassland systems in the southeastern United States. We're still discovering unique forms of genetic variation. And that's what's so fascinating about our grasslands is that we're still sort of uncovering new species and new, and new, new types of genetic variability in these systems. And again, it's a great example where you have these sort of unusual soil systems these shale outcrops in the Wachitas are, are, are quite rare and uncommon, and they appear to favor the evolution of endemism. And we see this in a number of other plant species that are also um, sort of restricted to these shale barren outcrops. So I've talked about edaphic and climate, and I'm gonna move on and talk about sort of megafauna and fire. And again, I wanna make the important point that many of our grasslands are shaped by all these factors. And so the sort of more con edaphically constrained grasslands that I just talked about, fire is also essential in maintaining the open grassland state of those systems and helping to support the diversity of, of grassland dependent species. So, we started working a couple of years ago in a system in north, north um, eastern Mississippi along what's called the Natchez Trace. And the Natchez Trace is this 450 mile ancient ecological corridor with probably a 10,000 year history. And historically, we know megafauna, including extinct bison in this region and elk, and perhaps before their, that time, um, other megafauna that are now extinct, you created a series of trail systems from Natchez, Mississippi, which is on the banks of the Mississippi River, all the way up to Nashville, Tennessee, to the Cumberland River. And this trail system basically connects three major waterways within the southeastern U.S., the Mississippi River, the Tennessee River, and then the Cumberland River up, up by Nashville. And it appears that megafauna created these trail systems to, um, uh, to, to, to move between these different water systems, which had, a, what's, had water licks or salt licks, which were essential for the survival of these megafauna. And so they often created these sort of trails or highways throughout the southeastern United States, connecting these important waterways and mineral licks. And in doing so, they also help to, I think, create and maintain some of our unique grassland systems. One of those systems is, is, is um, called the Black Belt Prairie. And that's where we've been working the past couple of years with the National Park Service that manages the Natchez Trace Parkway. And this Black Belt Prairie, this is a, a, a NASA satellite image here, is is a system that extends from Southern Alabama all the way up to the tip of, of Northern Tennessee. It's known for its really fertile um, limestone derived topsoils. The soils are very chalky in this region. And historically, uh, they called this the Black Belt Prairie because there were, there were extensive uh, uh, grassland systems uh, throughout, this, throughout, this, um, throughout this belt. And many of the grasslands have been have been altered or destroyed through agricultural development. They've been turned into soybeans or cotton. But there are some remaining remnants, and there's efforts underway right now to restore some of these uh, uh, degraded, degraded remnants that still exist in this system. 
One of the species we've been working with is Price's ground nut, Apios pricehina. This is a, a perennial herbaceous vine in the legume family, the Fabaceae. And, and this is not a grassland dependent species per se. It actually grows in calcareous mesic woodlands immediately adjacent to many of these black belt prairie systems uh, uh, here in, nor in northeastern Mississippi. And we've been working with the Park Service to try to restore populations of this species to black belt woodland and prairie systems that they've been, that they've been um, uh, managing with fire and thinning. But this is a species, although it's not necessarily a grassland dependent species because it grows in chinkapin oak calcareous uh, uh, woodlands adjacent to these prairies, I think it's a species that probably historically benefited from the ecological processes that help maintain these open prairie systems and grassland systems in this region. So um, fire and both megafauna probably helped to create some of the openness within these systems. And I think this is a disturbance dependent species that likely benefited from fire moving in across from these prairies into these mesic woodlands adjacent to these prairies. And so, again, this is a species that I think um, is sort of part of this ancient sort of grassland mosaic system. Another classic example of a species that we've worked with in the past that appears to be associated with megafauna is a species called Schwartz goldenrod, Solidago shortii. This is a federally endangered species. It's known primarily from um, a small area in Northern Kentucky, which uh, I'm showing down here in this red arrow. And a majority of the known individuals of this species occur in this Blue Licks Battlefield Nature Preserve. Um, Blue Licks Battlefield is the site of a famous American Revolutionary battle. And um, also contains buffalo traces. And the buffalo traces, uh, this is what I'm showing you here in this picture, this is Schwartz goldenrod, appears to be associated and grows adjacent to these buffalo traces. And one of the ideas is that um, buffalo, through their disturbance of wallowing and creating open habitat, may have benefited um, this particular species and maintain a more sort of open habitat grassland state in, in, in these systems. And there's an extinct population um, on the Ohio River in what's called the Falls of Ohio, but more recently a population was discovered in Indiana. And historically, there were buffalo traces connecting these two points. And so, again, sort of some further evidence that perhaps this is a species that appeared to benefit and associate with ancient buffalo uh, uh, traces within this sort of um, grasslandy woodland landscape. So this is a picture of Dr. Quinn Long, who's now the director of Shaw Nature Reserve, collecting seed of Schwartz goldenrod. Um, and this is pretty much the situation for this species. It's hanging on on a roadside here. This is a this is a road cut. Uh, and again, our our sort of seed collections are serving as a backup um, uh, for some of these less protected. Uh, a sites where this particular species grows. So finally, fire is an essential process in our grassland systems for maintaining biodiversity and structure and function. And one of the sort of challenges we have when working in grasslands in the Mid-South is that many of our grasslands are sort of smaller or patch scale grasslands, and they're typically embedded in mesic landscapes. And in these mesic landscapes, you get a lot of woody encroachment in the absence of fire. And in many of our grassland systems, fire has been excluded for a better part of a, a century or more, in some cases, probably a couple of centuries. And as a, as a result, it can be particularly challenging to identify on the landscape where some of these historical grasslands were, um, and where they and where they and where they particularly were on the landscape. And so, what I'm showing you here is a is a map on the left hand side of the slide from some work by Bryce Hanberry and Reed Noss that came out last year in Ecosphere. And what they did is they used a model to model um, the potential uh, distribution of grasslands here in the mid south. Um, based on how fire might move in the landscape. So they use things like topography and wind speed to create a model of how fire might move and where grasslands might occur 
within this landscape. So the pink areas you see are areas that have been mapped as grasslands by the Southeastern Grasslands Institute uh, by some ongoing work led by uh, Dr. Dwayne Estes at Austin Peay State University. And this map from Hanbury and Noss sort of uh, has these polygons where there's potential grasslands in the landscape. And these are really opportunities, I think, for us to think about um, future restoration uh, to try to restore some of these grasslands and where these grasslands might have occurred in the landscape. We have to know where they are first before we can begin to, to sort of restore these systems. And so my point of all this is that we're still discovering new species. We're still discovering where grasslands occur and we're still understanding the extent distribution uh, and, and, uh, and, and sort of abundance of these grasslands in our, in our historic landscape. So I'd like to sort of pivot for a moment, and I'd like to now spend the rest of my talk talking about um, some of the challenges and opportunities of restoring populations of grassland-dependent species. And I'm going to tell this story through the lens of some long-term research we've been doing with the grassland endemic species, Pines ground plum, Astragalus bibulatus. And this is a species that's federally endangered, and it's known from about eight sites in central Tennessee in these Nashville Basin limestone glade and woodland systems. And um, this is a species that's a long-lived perennial. Um, it, it, it begins flowering in, in, in spring and does most of its growth and reproduction in March, April, and May. It has pollinator-dependent reproduction and it produces seeds that can persist in the soil for probably many years and maybe a decade or more. And we've been working on trying to understand the biology of the species to um, develop solutions to reverse the decline of the species and to try to restore populations of the species. And I think we can learn a lot from the species that, um, I should say that a lot of the information we've learned from the species I think is applicable to many other grassland dependent species in the landscape. I want to take a moment and talk about these Nashville Basin Limestone Glade and Woodland Systems because they have floristic affinities to our Midwestern prairies. And um, I'm showing you three species that are um, highly, incredibly rare within these Nashville Basin Limestone Glade and Woodlands, and they're of conservation concern there, but they're much more abundant in our Midwestern and Great Plains prairie biome. Um, so we've got Evolvulus natalianus, Enothera macrocarpa, and Solidago gatingeri. Um, these are all species that are of grasslands in the Ozarks, and in, in some cases of Enothera nivolvulus, sort of further west in the Great Plains. But they're incredibly rare east of the Mississippi River. In fact, a couple of these species are only found east of the Mississippi River in this Nashville Basin limestone glade and wooden, woodland complex. And so this is a system that harbors a number of endemic species and a number of species of conservation concern. And many of the species that are extremely rare and endemic or near endemic to this system also have evolutionary lineages that are common in the Great Plains and Midwestern prairie biomes. So for example, uh, Pediomelum subacali is one of the classic endemics in these Nashville Basin uh, uh, grassland systems. One of its relatives, Pediomelum esculentum, is quite common across the Great Plains. So again, all those lime-colored uh, counties are known locations of that species. Astragalus babulatus, again, known from just a handful of sites in uh, central Tennessee. It's most, uh, uh, its most related congener, Astragalus crasicarpus, is super widespread all across the Great Plains and grasslands. Echinacea tennesseensis, this is another sort of extreme endemic uh, known from a handful of populations in these Nashville Basin grassland systems. Again, its closest relative or its presumed closest relative is an Echinacea angustifolia, and it's abundant throughout Great Plains grasslands. And so, you, and so species within the system have their sort of lineages and, 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 and evolutionary lineages throughout the prairie biome. And so I think I think that means that these species um, have evolved to experience fire and megafauna and all of those processes that help maintain the Midwestern prairie biome also applies to these same grassland systems in the Nashville Basin. So Pines ground plum, I think, has many of the characteristics of a remnant grassland species are the conservative species that we think about um, 
here, here in the Midwest. And so these are some examples of the characteristics that you'll find of these sort of grassland dependent um, um, species. They tend to be long lived. In the case of Pines ground plum, we've recorded individuals living for up to close to 20 years. Um, they tend to be slow growing. Many of our conservative remnant species tend to have low establishment from seed. They tend to have poor colonizing ability, meaning they're not very good at colonizing uh, a sites and moving around the landscape. They don't readily um, uh, colonize our restorations, uh, in part because they tend not to produce very much seed and they tend to have low establishment rates from seed. Many of our remnant grassland species also um, have a really strong resprouting capacity, and that's because they invest in storage organs below ground. So what I'm showing you on the right-hand slide is a nine-year-old Pines ground plum plant. So that's about six inches of growth above ground. And we can see that it's putting all of its resources in its first year into these below ground storage tap roots. And that's pretty typical of many grassland species. They're super slow growing above ground as they're sort of shunting their resources below ground. And that gives them the ability to resprout following disturbances associated with fire, with grazing, and with drought stress, and all these other factors that influence grasslands. So this also results in a really high root shoot ratio. So um, again, this is sort of allocating resources below ground rather than above ground. And so Pines ground plum, like many grassland dependent species, is super susceptible to, to woody encroachment. And in these, again, sort of more mesic landscapes, woody encroachment's a huge problem in the absence of, of, of fire. And long-term fire exclusion has resulted in dense woody vegetation in these grassland systems and the natural basin limestone glade and woodland complexes. And uh, making it to the point where there's almost a state shift from a grassland to a forested system. And again, it creates challenges for us to try to understand historically where these grasslands actually were because they've, they've undergone such a state change over a long time period. But this is some work that was uh, done by a student here working with us at the Missouri Botanical Garden where she looked at the effects of shade by woody encroachment in a common garden study with Pines ground plum. And so what she did is she, she she sort of simulated what um, eastern red cedar would do once it invaded or encroached upon the grasslands that pines ground plum grows in. And so what I'm showing you here is a spring shade treatment and a no shade treatment. And again, spring is when this species puts on its primary growth and flowering. And so on the left-hand side, you can see plants are about four times bigger when they're grown uh, without shade relative when we simulate um, about a 50% shading, 50 to 75% shading, excuse me, from that would sort of simulate eastern red cedar, which is one of the dominant uh, woody species that encroaches in these grasslands. If you look over on the right-hand side, we're looking at how individual plants allocate resources above and below ground. And again, the hallmark of many conservative remnant grassland species is they're allocating resources to below ground systems, and that's where uh, you tend to get really high root shoot ratios. So in these no shade environments, um, you're getting again, much higher root, root shoot ratios. In the no shade, or excuse me, in the spring shade, you get this dramatic reduction in, in allocation to roots. And, and so what this does to plants over time is this makes plants, grassland species weaker. It makes them less competitive and it makes them less resilient to future stresses such as herbivory or other disturbances above ground. They just have less resources uh, to resprout after those disturbances. And when we go out to natural populations of Pines ground plum, the few remaining populations grow in a variety of different conditions in terms of how much woody vegetation encroachment is in the habitat. We have some cases where uh, plants are growing primarily in forested systems because they they have so much woody encroachment and fire has been excluded for so long. And in those cases, we find plants tend to have fewer stems. We tend to find uh, fewer plants flowering uh, in, in, in our plots. And then we have uh, significantly lower fruit production relative to 
those areas that have ma been maintained open by some sort of typically anthropogenic disturbance. Usually it's a power line right away maintenance or um, uh, management by mowing that's that sort of help keep some of these some of these sites open that's where you see plants putting on greater growth and much greater reproduction and so what do you vegetation encroachment over time um, essentially reduces growth rate below ground it reduces the ability for these plants to reproduce and slowly over time these long-lived perennial plants begin to shrink in size above ground as they start sort of start to drain their below ground resources and eventually they're lost from the system if something's not done to open them back up into the open grassland state that they depend upon. So this represents an opportunity. And uh, in our grassland systems, we can use thinning and fire to reverse the degradation of these systems. And we've been um, uh, fortunate to work with the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation, and they've implemented a great restoration program in their, in their natural areas. Uh, several of which have populations of pines ground plum, and um, they've been using uh, uh, mechanical thinning and then using fire to restore the sort of open grassland state of these systems. So grassland dependent species require fire, but something we're learning from our research with pines ground plum is that um, not all fire is is good and fire at the wrong time um, can be problematic. And so grassland species are really sensitive to, to fire regime. Um, and so we noticed that in natural populations that were being burned um, later in the spring, that those populations were not looking as healthy as ones that were burned during the dormant season. And so we conducted an experiment where we uh, planted adult plants into into plots here, you can see plants growing in pots. We transplanted these in, in a, an experiment where we um, put plants in plots, and then we um, subjected those plots to a couple of different uh, uh, burn, timing of burn. So we had a dormant season burn in early February when the plants were dormant. And then we had a growing season, what I'm calling growing season burn. A growing season burn for this species is actually in early March, very early March when most things are still dormant, our earliest grassland species start to emerge. And this is one of those species that starts to emerge in early, in early March. And we've tracked the demographic fates of those plants and those different treatments over a three-year three period. We also had a control where we didn't, we didn't burn any of the plants. And what I'm showing you here is what we're calling multi-year fitness. So these are the number of legumes that individual plants produced over a three-year period after being subjected to, to one of these three treatments. And so you can see in the dormant season treatment, you get um, greater fruit production in plants than you do in the control or in the growing season treatment. And what happens in the growing season treatment is when you burn, just as plants are beginning to emerge from, from the soil, um, you get dieback. And, and those sort of injuries seems to reduce flowering rates in those species that experience, in those individuals that experience those growing season burns. Now, we found that control plants flowered at the same rate as those plants in our dormant season burn, but those plants in our dormant season burn treatment went on to produce more fruits per plant. And we think maybe what's happening there is that fire helps to um, do two things. One, it releases a flush of nutrients that might uh, provide additional resources to help promote fruiting and fruit production. Two, fire helps to remove litter and thatch in grasslands, and that makes grassland wildflowers more apparent eventually to pollinators. And we think what's happened is that pollinators are more likely to visit these plots that are open where the flowers are more visible, and they're more likely to cross-pollinate plants relative to plants in the control treatment that tend to be less visible due to the buildup of, of grass litter within these grassland systems. So again, grassland species depend on fire, but they need to have fire applied at the right time of the season. So we've also been working on restoring populations of this species. When we first started working with the species, um, it was known from just a, a, a few populations um, 
a couple of which were on unprotected sites, and there was real concern that the species was headed for extinction in the wild. Um, and so a reintroduction program began to try to restore populations to protected natural areas. And this process involves us sort of taking seed out of our seed bank, propagating the seed seedlings here at the Botanical Garden, uh, bringing those seedlings down to our protected areas in, in the Nashville Basin, and then outplanting them in suitable habitat. One of our main challenges with conserving with restoring grassland dependent species is seed availability. Many of our sort of remnant species are at risk species and, and many conservative species, again, they're not, they're not strong seed producers and they typically have low establishment from seed to begin with. Um, so seed availability is a real challenge for many of these at risk grassland species. And this is particularly true for Pines ground plum. And what I'm showing you here in this graph is we've been seed banking this species since 1990 at the Missouri Botanical Garden, long before I started working here. And over time, we've been building up uh, seed in our seed bank by making small sustainable seed collections from these handful of remaining natural populations. So each one of these dots that you see along this timeline represents a, a, uh, a natural population or in more recent years, some of our reintroduced populations are now um, producing seed that we're collecting from for, for to jumpstart our other uh, reintroduction efforts and other sites. And we even have extinct population in our seed bank as well. And so over time, we've been building up seed and we've been bringing this seed slowly out of our seed bank and we've been propagating in here at the garden. And then we've been using uh, this source material to sort of um, um, create these 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 reintroduced populations in protected areas. And um, I think this sort of, again, points to the importance of these sort of ex situ collections for these extremely rare species, because, uh, again, it's really challenging to build. Uh, you have to spend many years building up your seed, your seed um, availability in order to do these kinds of projects. But the other thing we've been doing to help amplify seed is is we've been um, doing sort of seed increase or seed production plots with this species. And we're gonna start doing that with some of our other at-risk grassland species where we're basically growing these out in a common garden uh, and letting them open cross-pollinate. And we can do this in this species because we know from our genetic data that historically there was quite a bit of gene flow among the natural populations. And we've been mixing up this genetic source material in our reintroductions to try to maximize genetic diversity. And so here's, uh, this picture on the right-hand part of your slide, these are the fruits of Pines Ground Plum uh, in our seed increase program. And again, we're collecting these, storing them, and then using them later for our, our restoration efforts. One of the challenges with Pines Ground Plum, and I think a number of other at-risk grassland species, is that many of these species have really narrow ecological amplitudes. In the case of Pines Ground Plum, this species is known from a single watershed in central Tennessee. And this watershed has a couple of different um, types of limestone. It has Lebanon limestone, which is shown here by the green. And then the Ridley limestone is shown by the purple. The natural populations of Pines Ground Plum are shown here in red. And they're pretty much all associated with this Lebanon limestone, which is a rare limestone in this system. In the past, we've conducted reintroductions into sites to grasslands underlain by this purple, this Ridley limestone. And over time, all those populations basically went extinct. They were unable to survive. And it turns out that, um, you know, this is a species that I think can probably only grow on this specific uh, a type of limestone, this Lebanon limestone. So the Lebanon limestone is, is much more well-drained, whereas the Ridley limestone tends to be thicker bedded and the soils underlain uh, on top of this Ridley limestone tend to hold water more. And this is a species that needs uh, really well-drained soils. And so again, this sort of narrow ecological amplitude sort of limits the sort of opportunities we can to reintroduce the species because we only have a handful of protected natural areas on these Lebanon limestone uh, uh, soil types. And so here's what I'm showing you on the right-hand side. Uh, we've tracked plants that were uh, 
uh, reintroduced to, to sites underlain by this Lebanon limestone against the drier limestone relative to plants on the Ridley limestone. If we look at the number of fruits produced by those plants over the course of several years, we find very few plants <laughs> go on to produce fruit and we get survival uh, of individual plants is about 40 to 50% less than what we find on the Lebanon limestone. So again, many at-risk grassland species have really narrow ecological amplitudes. And another issue that is a potential barrier to conserving and restoring populations of our at-risk grassland species is an overabundance of herbivores. And in the ecological literature, this is sort of called trophic downgrading. This is the idea that we've lost our apex predators in our ecosystems. We've lost wolves, we've lost mountain lions that help to control the abundance of our, of our herbivores. And we've done a really good job as humans of creating landscapes, uh, uh, highly fragmented and edgy landscapes that deer love. And in this particular system, we have overabundant deer that um, seem to be creating a serious problem for pines, ground plum, and, and some other species in our restoration projects. We get, we get a lot of top-down control by, by herbivores, particularly white-tailed deer. So what I'm showing you here is one of our restoration sites. These are reintroduced pines, ground plum plants. Uh, these plants are growing a meter apart. These are plants that have been in a cage for several years. You can see that they're about uh, three or four times larger than the plants that have been exposed to, to white-tailed deer um, and haven't had a cage on them for several years. And so these plants that are exposed to herbivores at some sites, they never go on to flower and they never go on to reproduce. And so herbivores and changes in our trophic system are a real problem. And finally, I'm gonna finish with some new research we've been working on, and that's looking at the soil microbiome for remnant grassland species. And in the case of Pines ground plum, and I think this is probably the case for some other remnant grassland specialist species, they seem to be sensitive to the soil microbiome. So this was some work led by a graduate student, Rachel Becknell at Washington University, who worked with us here at the garden. And what she did is she went out to natural population sites of Pines ground plum, we're calling these historically present glades, and she collected small amounts of soil from five different sites. And then she went to sites that Pines ground plum does not grow at, but these are protected natural areas that seem to have suitable habitat for Pines ground plum. So they have the Lebanon limestone, they have the same soil type, they have many of the same vegetation associates that we find in, in, in sites where Pines ground plum grows. And she collected soil from those sites and she did what's called a plant soil feedback experiment. So she came back to the greenhouse here and she grew Pines ground plum in soil the soil, the background soil was sterilized and she inoculated the soil with live soil from natural population sites or live soil from our future reintroduction sites. And what she found was that in live soil, the plants grew larger when they were grown in soil collected from the natural population sites relative to the sites where the species was not known from. When you sterilize the inoculum, and that's the blue bars here, you see no difference between uh, the growth of Pines ground plum in soil inoculum from the natural population sites versus the historically absent glade sites or our future reintroduction sites. And so what that means is that when you remove the microbiome by sterilizing the soil, you're losing something that's benefiting this species. And there appear to be microbes um, or at least the species is able to cultivate microbes when you give it soil from its natural population sites that it can't do when it's given soil from these sites that it's historically absent from. And so soil microbiome appears to be playing a role in this grassland dependent species. So I hope I've um, helped to illuminate some of the challenges and opportunities we have with restoring at-risk grassland species. And I really appreciate your time this afternoon. And I wanna give a big thanks to um, all of the different sponsors who've been funding this research and all of our partners who we've been working with in, in many of our field studies. Thank you. Matthew, thank you very much for your uh, wonderfully organized presentation. My name is Carol David. I'm the executive director of the Missouri Prairie Foundation, and I um, would like to relay as many of your questions
um, as possible to Matthew in the time that we have remaining. And there are quite a few questions. Um, there was a, a question early on that Mara had when you were speaking about um, looking at microclimates. Um, why is the soil temperature measured about one centimeter below the soil? Why not uh, deeper? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so we were interested in, in just below the soil surface because we were interested, that's where most of the seeds are, and that's where most of the seeds fall, is in that sort of top little layer of organic matter. And so um, we were really interested in what seeds we're experiencing um, in those sort of edaphically constrained grasslands. And so that's why we put them at one centimeter. And I should say soil is a great insulator of, of heat. And so I would expect the further down you go, um, it's likely you're not going to find uh, those kinds of elevated temperatures because soils are great, has great insulated properties. Thank you. That makes sense. Um, quite a few questions about the role of megafauna um, in the past on uh, plant populations and surrogates uh, today. Um, so I'll try to, there's a, numerous questions here. Um, for example, perhaps uh, megafauna were needed for scarification and transport of some seeds like astragalus, the fruits or seeds of, astra of things like astragalus. Um, what do you think about that? Um, so the answer is Probably, but we, we we don't fully know because those are sort of difficult to um, experiment, sort of experimentally test. In the case of Pine's ground plum, um, its seeds have a double seed coat, and they're they're sort of difficult to germinate. You really have to scarify the seed well, and we've get our sort of greatest germination rates um, with sulfuric acid dips followed by cold stratification. So it's conceivable that um, the fruits, as you notice, were, were were quite showy in that species. It's possible that those fruits could survive the guts of of bison or or historic megafauna, and and perhaps they could have been dispersed around the landscape in that way. That's certainly a, a possibility. Um, in the case of something like uh, Schwartz goldenrod, the one uh, species I, I talked about in Kentucky. I think in that case, it's certainly possible that seeds were attaching to the fur of bison as they were moving across these trails and then dropping uh, in, in, in these sort of open habitats, and that's how it potentially could have moved around the landscape. Thank you. And for those who are, may not be familiar with the term scarification, it, uh, would you say, Matthew, it's about sort of scratching the surface of the, of the seed to al allow for germination? Exactly. So many legumes have physical dormancy and the seed, the seed coat has to be knit to allow water to get into the seed and that starts the germination process. Thank you. What about using domesticated grazers like cattle or goats to um, contribute to restoration and increase populations of threatened species? Um, I think that's a, a, a really site specific uh might be it might be applicable to certain situations but not all but could you could you shed some light on this so we haven't done any experimentation with cattle specifically many of the sites that we've been working at are um what i would consider postage stamp remnants um and so they're small in area. And, and um, I think in those contexts, it's it it would be challenging to use cattle uh, to to manage those sites. If you did it, you'd have to do it very carefully and at a pretty small scale, um, given given the the state of these systems. And I think many of the systems we've been working at, um, have experienced degradation through um, probably extensive livestock grazing in the past. And, and so we see some evidence of that in some of these grassland systems we've been working at. Um, 
So I think that's that's a potential fruitful area of research in the future, and it's just something we don't have data for. But again, I think it would be something that, you know, would would be you, you'd want to do it experimentally and very carefully to understand um, the role of of cattle and how they may be influencing the habitat conditions for some of these at risk species. Thank you. And and there was a question about goats as well, and. Uh, I would imagine the uh, similar considerations would need to be taken for, for goats. And, and you're right, you're talking about some of these sites are extremely small and, and the sheer logistics of moving livestock in and out of them would be also difficult. Yeah. Um, um, you mentioned Shawnee Nature Reserve a number of times. And for those who are unfamiliar, Shawnee Nature Reserve is about... Um, uh, 40 minutes south or west of, of St. Louis, and it's a, a satellite facility of the Missouri Botanical Garden where some of this work is, is taking place. And there was a question from Jack about what are the challenges and opportunities in making Shaw a show place for rare grassland species? Well, I would say um, so, so some of the some of the challenges are the same ones I've mentioned in in the talk. So seed availability for our super rare things and our more conservative things is certainly a challenge. Um, I still don't think we have a handle on how to establish some of these more conservative remnant species from seed. Um, we we have put some of these um, on display in a more horticultural setting, but not in the actual grassland restoration setting. Um, and so that's certainly something that we we are um, going to be researching, experimenting in the, with in the future. But it's a great opportunity because Shaw Nature Reserve is visited by so many people, and it's a great opportunity for us to showcase rare grassland species and um, high quality uh, restorations. And so that is certainly a, a fabulous opportunity for us in the future to do. Thank you. Melanie asks, do you have any idea how many other plant species are in very dire straits in terms of surviving that we don't even know about? So that's sort of a difficult question. What do you know that we don't know? <laughs> but, uh... Yeah, this was like, wasn't that Donald Rumsfeld? The the the, un, the known unknowns are something. <laughs> um, he, he... Yeah, I mean, I, I'm assuming this question is referring to my one uh, slide talking about the discovery of a cryptic species in, in the landscape, this, this sort of unique bladder pod in the Wachita Mountains of Arkansas. I, I don't have a sense for how, how common that may be, but um, I'm certain the more we look and the more we conduct research, the more we're going to discover. And, and, and how many... And at what frequency, I really can't say off the top of my head, but I think if you look at um, if you look at the flora of the southeastern U.S., we're discovering new species at a pretty good clip still. And, and so um, I expect that to continue into the future. Thank you. And, and back to um, some questions about um, kind of surrogates for for disturbance in the past. Um, for example, so Mark has a question prior to the to uh, the killing of bison was fire as necessary as it has been in the past two centuries when great herds roamed grassland trampling woody species and grazing plants through the seasons, including residues in winter was fire necessary and what was there to burn. Uh so yes, I think fire was still necessary and still essential process on the landscape and those systems. And remember, historically, um, these grassland systems look so much different than they did today, right? There was uh, there was so much greater connectivity on the landscape, and bison moved across huge geographic areas, and so they weren't necessarily uh, always in one particular location. And so um, these grasslands build up fuels very quickly, and so I'm 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 certain that that fire was was always an essential process, and and grazing and fire are important modulators of grassland biodiversity across the landscape. Historically, have been, uh, and, and and I think in in our larger prairie landscapes continue to be. Thank you. Um, regarding the Natchez Trace, which has um, which is in an, in an area of less soil deposit 
William asks, any attempt to search for species of the Natchez Trace in the Lust Hills formation of I Missouri and Iowa, would you consider the prairie plants of the Lust Hills more fire dependent or more soil dependent? Um, would I consider them more? That's a good question. I, I don't, I, I would say they're both. <laughs> I, I don't know if the, if it's one or the other. I think I think both of these processes uh, are important in shaping grassland biodiversity, and you get some species that have um, have evolved to uh, unusual soils or stressful soils or unique soils. Um, but to maintain the the open habitat state of those systems, you're going to have to have fire typically too at, at some interval. So I would say it's both. Thank you. Another question about for species that need well structured or well drained soil, do you use cover crops to improve permeability in restoration projects? Um, so I can speak for some work at the Shaw Nature Reserve. So, so a lot of our work with at risk species, we're sort of working at the population level and we're letting and we're working in sort of degraded remnants, so we're not we're not using cover crops. But a project at Shaw Nature Reserve right now, a large scale 120 acre grassland restoration, is using cover crops um, uh, before seeding. Um, not necessarily for drainage, but more of uh, well, more for uh, to prevent soil erosion and, and to sort of stabilize the soil before native seeds can get put down. So it is, do, do you have information on the importance of soil structure um, in addition to the soil microbiome? Is, is the soil structure important? I'm sure it is, but I'm not exactly <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that's a difficult one. I mean, I would say like we're still... Um, we're still at the early stages, I think, of research on these sort of plant soil interactions within these some of these grassland systems. There's another question um, about uh, biome soil sensitivity. Terry asks, is the conclusion that competing plants add something to the biome that is impacting the endangered plants? Ah, I see. Interesting. Um, so the answer is that in some cases, competing plants can release alle allelopathic chemicals um, that in turn give them a competitive advantage. So allel allelopathic, allelopathic chemicals are chemicals in the soil that may um, alter the growth rate of, uh, of another species. Um, other plants can also alter the soil microbiome uh, in ways that can can uh, negatively influence um, um, another plant species. And again, this is sort of mm, a, a sort of new area of a relatively new area of research that is um, we don't have all the answers to yet. Thank you. Um, this might be the last question. It seems like there's a great need to understand the life history stages and functions within populations of plant species to understand how their populations are doing. For instance, to management, woody encroachment, or climate change. Are there any patterns or observations that might help inform land stewards on how a rare prairie species is doing within an area? Well, the, the really only way to know how it's doing to measure the health of a species is to monitor the populations over several years. And, um, and, and typically you need to do that at multiple sites to understand what's a healthy population and what's a population that's experiencing stress. And that's what we did in the case of Pines Ground Plum. It wasn't until we had several years of monitoring data did we begin to understand the role of woody encroachment and the role of uh, sort of you know, different um, uh, uh, microenvironmental variation uh, within those sites and how that was influencing those populations. So I think you need to have really good monitoring over a couple of years before you can start to assess that. Thank you.
Well, I think we are out of time, but I wanted to, um, again, thank you very much, Matthew, for your very important work, excellent presentation, and, and want to thank everyone for tuning in and uh, thank MPF staff who um, uh, coordinated uh, the logistics for this presentation. Um, and I want to thank all of our MPF supporters who uh, provide for us to be able to acquire property and steward them year round to provide habitat for many species of conservation concern, including rare plants. Um, all of our properties together support at least 70 to 72 different species of conservation concern. And we are very serious about monitoring. When we acquire um, a, a, a property, we do baseline floristic assessment and then repeat that um, over time to evaluate our uh, management to make sure that our stewardship is in uh, uh, sustaining and even enhancing those rare uh, populations. I also want to invite everyone to um, register for our next webinar on January 3rd. We'll have a panel of, uh, I believe, three speakers about fens in the Ozarks. And uh, that's another really fascinating topic. Um, and we'll have some uh, bird uh, guided bird hikes in February and many, many other um, programs. And uh, Haley is busy uh, coordinating webinars and masterclasses for 2024. So please check in with us on upcoming events. And again, thank you everyone, especially uh, Matthew and uh, wish everyone very happy holidays.